welcome to everybody uh, to the second part of the Welsh Athletics Performance webinar series. Um, my name's Liz and I lead on the Endurance Pathway Development for Welsh Athletics. Um, tonight for our second webinar we are very lucky to be joined by another great guest um, in Helen Clitheroe. Um, we'll be taking us through coaching the female endurance athlete. Um, so Helen will go again touch a little bit on her background um, just as a bit of an introduction, not that she really needs one. Um, so Helen's um, obviously um, an ex-athlete, has competed at the highest level um, in the sport for both Great Britain and England. Um, she's won European and Commonwealth Games medals and is a two-time Olympian, so brings a great wealth of experience from an athlete background. Um, Helen's also made the successful transition from athlete to coach as well. Um, and coaches her own group of athletes, as well as being a performance coach at the Leeds Talent Hub, which is one of the England Athletics Talent Hubs. So yeah, great to have Helen here this evening. Um, so just again, before I hand over to Helen, um, there'll be time at the end of the presentation for questions. So please make sure you put your questions in the questions box as we go along. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to Helen and enjoy your evening. Thanks, Liz, and thanks for having me here tonight. I'm just going to share my screen, so hopefully that is on your screen now. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about coaching the female athlete tonight. Um, oh, paused. What's that? Ah, I had a little panic then. I think that it's going to work. Um, so yeah, just as Liz said, I don't want to go on too much about what I did in athletics, but in case people online didn't um, aren't aware of what I did, I sort of competed um, in athletics from the age of 11, mainly running middle distance for the uh, majority of my career, running 1500. Um, then I moved up to the steeplechase. I also ran um, across country quite a lot, competed indoors and also on the road. So I've just listed sort of my times there for you to have a look at. Um, yeah, so now I'm coaching. I started coaching when I was still competing actually, um, just with a few guys from, my local area who used to train with me and um it just it was quite an organic thing really i i said they were doing the sessions that i was doing that my coach was setting me and um i just realized that these guys needed their their program tweaking a little bit to suit them as they were improving at a quicker rate than i was um so i started coaching one guy and then had a few others sort of asking me locally to um, to coach them. I'd done my coaching qualification when I was probably about 2004, I think, so when I was still competing. Um, so yeah, I think it was just quite a natural thing for me to do was to get into coaching. Um, when I start, uh, stopped competing um, internationally, I sort of straight away let, let it be known that I was quite keen to sort of coach at a performance level. And luckily I got the chance to coach um, as a team coach at the European Cross Country, which I've done for many years now, also the World Cross, and I've done quite a few junior competitions as well for Great Britain. So I was lucky that I had the opportunity, obviously having been an athlete, opened those doors for me um, to, you know, to be part of the um, team setup, which is, you know, it's quite a challenge in itself because the guys there that you're coaching aren't your personal athletes um, usually. So you're, you're more of a sort of team manager i suppose you're getting them to the start line and dealing with any any trouble that there might be along the way so yeah so coach still coaching quite a few people i coach a few people from a distance and um, which is i guess a lot of us have been doing during this last year um and over for about a year and a bit i've been coaching at the leeds hub and um, where i'm assistant coach with andy henderson who's the head coach um and that's a new um setup um based at Leeds Beckett University, where athletes have applied to be part of the, the hub and they get an opportunity to um, use the facilities, work with um, some various sort of services, such as physio and um, physiology, nutrition, psychology. So it's a really great setup. Um, hopefully it'll start rolling forward with a bit more momentum once we get going again, sort of in person. We have been able to coach the elite guys there um, throughout the lockdown, this this lockdown anyway. Um, but yeah, we've, we've had a lot of guys who've had to go home during that period of time. So it's been quite a challenge as I'm sure we've all um, um, had during this last 12 months. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about my athlete experience because 
when we were chatting about what to talk about on this webinar, it was sort of like, I, have, I do coach quite a few girls, but I mainly coach guys actually, but also just things that I've learned from my journey and then now apply to coaching. So um, just a little bit of my background. I started um, athletics when I was, I started running before I joined the club actually, I started doing fun runs and my parents used to take me to fun runs. Loved running from primary school. Our teacher um, got us into running and we were training for the uh, primary schools cross country in Preston. I'm from Preston in Lancashire. Um, loved it straight away and joined Preston Harriers when I was age 11 um, and honestly I was quite an average runner. I was county, you know, uh, county level, you know, competed at county championships, qualified for English schools championships twice, never made the final. I'm probably 100% sure that no teacher at my school, high school anyway, would have ever thought that I would be the one to go on and compete in Olympic Games or be a professional athlete. So uh, it certainly wasn't sort of obvious that um, I was gonna be a successful athlete. Um, and it's a little bit, I, I, this, a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about tonight aren't female only, they're athlete sort of issues. Um, but yeah, I guess for me, it was, I was a late developer um, on, on a few levels. Um, I, I probably only started taking, I, although I went to Harriers and never missed a session, I didn't really take it so seriously till I was probably about 19, 20. Um, even though I sort of wanted, you know, wanted to run well at English schools and things like that, I probably didn't really uh, realize my potential. Nobody suggested to me that if I did ABC that I could be better. Um, so yeah, it, it was quite a journey till that first Great Britain Vest, which I, I got for the World Cross Country, and I was 24 when I got that, so that was a, a straight into the seniors. Never did anything as a junior, um, and I think that's something that um, you know athlete, athletes in general expect to have that sort of rapid um, journey upwards to success, and it, sometimes it doesn't happen like that. And I think it's important as far as coaches, especially at club level, to sort of see that athletes might take a little bit longer to develop into that sort of senior age group and even and especially in endurance develop to their potential you might not see it straight away um i was lucky that i had uh, jeremy harriers was my first coach at, at preston harriers and he was a, a really great coach quite a scientific minded coach and i think once he realized i was sort of started taking it a little bit more seriously he you know he really took me under his wing and we had a great relationship um, this is back when we didn't have mobile phones, we didn't have uh, computers to email each other, so we we spoke on the phone a lot. Um, I met I met up with him a lot. Um, you know, I get sort of sessions written and posted to me sometimes, or he'd give me a you know the plan and a piece of paper, um, and I was sort of quite you know we we had a very very good relationship. Um, talked about everything. Um, so yeah, I was lucky that uh, Jerry took me under his wing and there was another girl in our group that was, um, she qualified for the World Cross as a junior. Uh, she was a little bit younger than me, but I think it just gave me that little bit of a, a belief, I suppose, that actually I'm not that much different to her. And if I trained harder than, or was a bit more applied, you know, at the time I was sort of working, I was going out a lot with my friends, you know, sort of my, I guess I was just enjoying being a sort of young teenager well, and that and running was just a hobby. Um, but I, I started just to sort of think actually if, I, if I'm a bit more applied and train a little bit more sort of seriously then see what I could do. Um, and when, uh, when I made the team for the World Cross, um, I think I, I don't know how many miles a week I was running. I, I guess I was probably running 30 miles a week, but 30 to 40 miles a week I'm thinking. I remember we went on a... Um, we went on a training camp to Portugal before the World Cross and the athletes like Paul Radcliffe, Liz Yelling and so on were there and all these girls who I'd looked up to for many years and never really believed I'd be on a team with them and um, I didn't even know they went the athletes went running twice a day I did not have a clue so we'd gone for our run in, in the morning and um, then the girls started getting ready to go out again in the evening. I was like, where are you going? Um, and I remember speaking to my coach at the time. So, you know, I was 24. It wasn't like I was a, a kid. I was like, everyone's going running twice a day. Do you, you know, am I not training hard enough? Um, but Jerry, thankfully, you know, just 
he didn't hold me back he just sensibly developed me to build up to a, a level of training so I was already at a GB level um, and I could have easily looked at what those girls were doing and copied it um, but thankfully uh, Jerry sort of knew that I needed to be sort of gradually built up to, to sort of increasing mileage increasing training intensity I actually was I think I was the second counter back at that race from GB it was the when the 4k was in in the world cross so yeah um you know it was good that I stuck with what I was doing didn't change all my training on, on that camp and uh, believed in in my program um and then yeah consistency I've noted there it's like I think that was as an athlete that was my secret to success I often tell people um about the year when I ran my 1500 PB um, 401 and I look back, I always kept a diary, look back in my training diary and there is nothing outstanding in that diary, but what there is is consistent training. Um, there was, you know, you hear about PB sessions and things like that. There was nothing that really stood out as amazing sessions, but it was just like getting the work done, every session completed every session at the sort of level that was required and I think that sort of stayed through my career and also I think um the fact that I wasn't I was under trained so it's like in athletic terms it's sort of training years I was probably quite young as an athlete at 24 um and I think that the fact that we I sort of not overtrained as a junior gave me that consistency and gave me that longevity actually because I I was 37 when I won the European indoor championships so from 24 to 37 I pretty much made teams every year for various disciplines so you know that consistency was definitely the secret to my success as an athlete and um, so yeah just to, as I said before sort of going from that fun runner to English skills so if I remember at the English skills champs I was probably a senior you know, not getting through to the final, being in tears, thinking, what am I bothering for? To winning a championships at the age of 37. Um, the transition I, that we talk about often is that sort of junior to, to under 23 to senior. And we often talk about it in relation to sort of athletes who are already at that sort of high level of competition. So already on the, you know, making the GB, we want to see juniors who've made the GB team progress to being a senior on the GB team but sometimes like myself you know I was nowhere near that level I was not even getting into the final at the English girls champs um so for me playing the long game was was massive um and I definitely have Jeremy to thank for that um that he he sort of kept me on straight and narrow didn't let me overtrain, let me grow let me build my training up um gradually and you know looked at me as a as an individual athlete so yeah which brings me onto this slide so when I've been thinking about this this webinar the main thing that I think of when coaching is coaching the individual um, and when I've spoke to people I, at the end of the session I've, I'll show you a few quotes I've got from coaches that I have asked about what they do differently when coaching a female compared to a male and quite a lot of them have said I coach the person I coach the individual so of Obviously, coaching the individual is massively important in uh, in coaching, and if you don't do that, then you just set the same training for a group of people. You might get one rise to the top and a few that just don't really move on because you've not looked at their individual needs. But there are challenges um, for a female athlete. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my my sort of journey. Um, I didn't really struggle too much with puberty, but I probably wasn't training very hard. So I didn't really notice any, any issues with my running, had a couple of injuries. I didn't start my periods till I was probably about 15, I think. I know my younger sister started before me, which was like, I was a bit worried about, but, but yeah, I started my period and I never missed a period um, throughout my running career, even when I was running 5K, 10K, running sort of 90 plus miles a week at times, I always kept a regular period, which is something I'm really proud of. Um, and it's something that, uh, I, as much as we talk about females losing their period when they endurance athletes, 
we need to talk about females who have a period and what we do with it as well. So yeah, um, talk a little bit about periods, whether your athlete has a regular or irregular period, talking about the changes in our bodies. Um, you know, you might have gone from sort of a completely different body shape as you've grown into adult life and what that impact that has on, on your athletics. Um, the issues around body shape and sort of people's perception of you or your perception of yourself. So, which can obviously affect the way you eat, the way you exercise and all these things, if not looked at properly, can lead to red S. Um, red S is a, a, the term now, we used to talk about the female athlete triad, which is sort of losing your period and the things that are linked with that. The red S is the new term from, I'll just put this screen, this on the screen now. Um, Red S is reduced energy deficit in sport. And this is not just female, uh, this is males and females. Basically, if you don't eat enough for what you're asking your body to do, you could look, you could look at, look into this sort of, if you look at the, um, the circle here, you can see all the, the things that can lead to red S or a part of red S. Um, and this is something that, you know, thankfully over the last few years, we've had lots of um, information about it. It's not something I'm an expert on. So I, you know, I'd, I'd like to sort of say, look into this. If you don't know about Red S, you need to um, look into it, especially if you're coaching females. Um, these two sli slides here give you a few ideas of, of um, things that might happen if, if your athlete isn't getting enough energy in the body and the impact it can have on them as a athlete and as a person. So it's not just losing the period, um, but it's it's all sorts of things. It can lead to injury risk. Um, you might not be responding to your training anymore, judgment, impaired judgment, coordination problems, concentration issues, moodiness, irritability, um, irritability depression, moods, um, decreased glycogen stores, so you're not recovering, um, muscle strength issues, and in a decreased endurance performance. So for endurance athletes, this is really, really important. Um, we were lucky enough to, a few years ago, Jess Pia Piasecki, um, who's a marathon runner, who you might have heard of, runs for Great Britain, is, is an expert in this field. And uh, She's done quite a lot of talks you might have already listened to on online um, or webinars recently. Um, and her talk is really, really brilliant. You know, she talks about how, because she is an athlete who has suffered from Red S. So I recommend if you've not heard her speak that you would look into um, finding one of her webinars. Um, she'll talk to be able to tell you in more detail than I can about the sort of intricacies of red S. Um, so yeah, injury risk. Um, I spoke to a few physios of friends of mine who work a lot with um, endurance athletes and you know there's things that you, we sort of know um, but anecdotally there are a higher risk um, in female athletes of stress fractures and bone issues, shin splints and Brunner's knee um, and most of these are, you know, as females, we're having to adapt to big changes in our bodies post-puberty, um, as well as growth spurts, which applies to males as well. Um, but changes in our sort of pelvis area, or tr you know, trunk area are, are massive. And um, the pelvic tilt um, can cause issues. So the importance of um, strength and conditioning with a female athlete is, is massive. Um, we, quite often see that uh, females are sort of weaker around that trunk area, so core, glute areas, um, uh, and that will often lead to these issues. Obviously the stress fracture um, is quite often linked to red S, um, so we have to investigate in that instance, is there any underlying issues that could have caused um, the athlete to be susceptible to stress fractures? There are cases where stress fractures are just pure bad luck, um, but there's definitely cases where under eating, um, food issues, nutrition issues, not recovering, and all the things that I mentioned from Red S um, 
definitely have a bearing on those things. Um, the importance of nutrition, like I said, just making sure the athlete is fueling their body um, for what, the, what you're asking them to do. Um, and recovery is you know, massive, especially around uh, when the athlete is on the menstrual cycle. So um, a lot of athletes do have a reg healthy regular cycle um, and it's something I, I find we don't talk about quite as often, but it is a big, big issue because as coaches, we have to plan around it. Some athletes, um, everyone's different, everyone's different and it might change year to year. Um, so if I'm talking about myself from when my experience being an athlete, um, like I said earlier, I always had a regular period. Um, I tried going on to the pill, which was did not work for me. It, it gave me um, a bleed for like most of the month, which was not great for being an athlete. Um, so I, I decided I wasn't going to do that. And then I was a little bit sort of pig headed, I suppose. I was just not happy about taking anything to change my natural cycle. So. I did, um, I did just have to, you know, sometimes my period, you know, affected my training, certainly affected races, um, but it was something that I just had to um, get used to and deal with. Um, I tracked, I, I wish there'd been a period tracking tool available when I was an athlete. I think it would have made a massive difference and a bit of really, really good help. Um, I always spoke to my coach about it, sometime, sometimes more, more often than not, I would like just not mention it. Um, for example, I've had great races when I was on my period. I ran my first, uh, my personal best for fifteen hundred. Equally, I remember I was in the final of the world champs. I think I came eleventh, um, and my period happened in the cool, uh, warm up area. So just before I was dealing with that, and I felt terrible in the race. I remember walking off. I mean. You know, I was 11th in the world champs, which isn't, in retrospect, it's not too bad. But at the time, I was, I remember walking off the track and feeling like everyone was looking away from me, um, walking past the press area. Nobody wanted to ask me a question. And, and even if they had, at that time, you couldn't say, oh, I felt a bit, bit bad because I got my period. Um, you know, so now I feel like um, we're in a different place. Athletes are talking about this more regularly with there's more um, information out there about how things you can do to change, including nutritionally. Um, I'm just going to show you, if you wonder why my phone screen's on the screen, I'm just going to show you this. this is the, I'm going to show you two period tracker apps, which are really, really good, um, which your athlete can use and share this information with you if they want to. Um, so this one is the Garmin um, Connect. So if you, your athlete uses a Garmin watch, this is on the Garmin Connect. So as you can see, it gives you different colors for um, different parts of your cycle. Um, it gives you, for that day of the cycle, it'll give you some information. And then you can log different symptoms throughout the month of how you're feeling. So you can start building a bit of a picture. You can also add notes start building a bit of a picture of where you where you are where your athlete is and when they feel good or bad um, around their menstrual cycle so I think that is really really important um, and then this this other app I'm going to show you is the fitter woman app this is a free app as well um, this one's really really good it gives you some really good tips on how your how your athlete might be feeling or how the athlete's feeling. So I think especially for young um, athletes who are just starting to get them to become aware of what's going on and what makes them feel good. And if they eat something different, then that might help them feel better at certain times of the month. Or if they if their tra uh, training um, that you suggest might need to be tweaked at certain times in the month, this app is great. So I'm just going to roll through it. I might roll through it twice. So gives you the phase of your period um, and then it'll give you little tips of, of what happens in them, them phases so again for a young athlete this is great uh, and then I'm just going to scroll through so it talks about physiology what you are what you might be feeling at this particular day of your cycle and um, what might be happening in your body 
So that's really useful. So it gives you just a bit of a picture of where, where you are. Uh, it gives you some tips on training, what, what might work better at this part of your cycle and um, recovery. And then also nutrition gives you um, examples of what types of food would be good to eat at this point of your cycle. So it's it's really, really good, a great educational tool as well for females. Again, you can um, log any symptoms and make notes. So really, really useful um, for an athlete to get to know their body um, and for a coach to maybe help them help you plan um, maybe where the races are or hard tra harder training or a down week and things like that. Um, so yeah, the main thing here for an athlete and coach is to chat about this and the, for the athlete to communicate with the coach. So for example, some of the girls who are coach will just drop me a message, um, got my period today and I'll put a note on, I use training peaks with my athletes. Um, so I'll put a note on training peaks that the period is there. Some athletes, if they have issues, then we talk about that. And we we maybe talk to a nutritionist um, to try and if there's anything else that we can do, anything that we can be adding to the diet um, to help with um, symptoms um, such as you know having bad stomach, gut issues around your cycle, um, that sort of thing. So that's that's what I do with some athletes. So. Every, like I say, it's about the individual. So every, every athlete's different and they might want to communicate this in a different way. But the main thing is that you're talking about it and you're respecting that this happens um, for a majority of, of females. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about body image now. Um, so body image is how an athlete perceives themselves. Um, and in endurance, athletes are, various shapes and sizes especially in middle distance running i think i remember when i was a 1500 meter runner there was all sorts of different types of bodies on the line i thought i was absolutely fantastic you know some girls are quite muscular some are very lean some are tall some are short it's 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 great so there's no definite type but i think the more um the further distance we go up then perhaps there is a body type that is expected or that girls sort of often aim for. Um, the language that I, that we use around body image is really, really important um, as a coach, as friends, um, as and as athletes. Um, talk, you know, females do talk about their body shape a lot and they do have insecurities. So being sort of mindful of language that we use is, is really important. And then uh, the bottom point I put there in capitals is social media now social media is something that I never dealt with as an athlete but it's something that I'm aware of can make uh, massive differences we're looking at um, body shapes all the time maybe athletes thinking that this is where you have to look to be um, a top class runner people making comments etc uh, etc et and I just thought I'd share this um, little story and um, the picture that you can see there is of me running the 4k world cross race in 2004 um this was my i did the world cross eight times and this was my best ever race and i i was leading the race i, I was i was quite known for sort of going out quite fast in races so i remember like going out really hard leading the race and i i think i finished um the top 20 i was 19th so it's my best result um you know it's when I think back now, great performances across country, and I wasn't, I never really, really thought of myself as a cross country runner, but, um, you know, this was something I did most years. Um, so yeah, absolutely delighted after the race that I had such a good run. Um, came home and, you know, a few weeks later, I was down at the club and like, oh, we've, we've got a letter for you. It's like a fan letter, wow, <laughs> didn't get many of them. So uh, we've got this letter and um, somebody, a male, had taken the time to write a quite a long letter that I uh, read and immediately sent to British Athletics. So I did not keep this letter and I have never looked at it since. I can remember most of the content of that letter. Um, the, the, the person kindly mentioned that I was less lean and lithe as other athletes, that 
compared to Paula Radcliffe, who was, I was a 1500 meter runner at the time and Paula was a marathon runner at the time, that I, I was, you know, my body shape was completely different and that um, maybe if I was to drop two to three kilos, that that would make a massive difference to my performance. So as you can imagine, I was absolutely, I was shocked and angry because I was an athlete who was quite sort of, didn't really think about that often. I didn't think about what other people thought about what I looked like. I just always strived to be the best version of myself. So I knew I was quite a strong girl. I knew I was like good in the gym. So I'm quite muscular. Um, and I thought that's that's my strength. I still think that, you know, but when that person wrote that down and sent it to me, that just for for a week or two, something just changed in my mind. And um, I can't, I'll be lying if I said it didn't affect what I, how I uh, approached my eating for a couple of weeks, but uh, thankfully uh, it didn't have any long-term effects. But what I was most angry about was that I knew that had this person and I don't know if they did, sent letters to other people that I knew um, that that would have an absolutely devastating effect on, on them and what they would, um, how they would react would be, you know, probably quite a dangerous, um, a dangerous thing. So, you know, talking about the way that girls sort of maybe become anorexic or bulimic, you know, things like this, comments like this can, can, um, have that reaction so I thought I'd share, share with you that story because I, I think like now it's so much easier for athletes to sort of get these sort of comments or people saying you don't look like this I know I recently read um about Marilyn Okoru she just recently retired from running 800s and she's spoken out quite often about you know how people told her she didn't look like an 800 meter runner all this sort of stuff. I remember being at competitions myself and, you know, people saying, oh, what event do you do? Are you a pole vaulter? Or, you know, obviously didn't fit that, that typical mould. So I think just being aware that um, your female athletes will do have varying sort of experiences with um, how they perceive themselves, how others might perceive them and how they might hear about this. Um, and just being mindful that it's something that might need to be talked about Luckily, I was um, with that particular instance. I I sort of went straight to British Athletics. I was I just wanted the person sort of to be um, informed that this wasn't appropriate. Um, wasn't certainly wasn't appropriate to send to an athlete, and I think that was dealt with. I didn't really uh, I didn't go into it further than that. I don't even know who it was who sent it me, but maybe they maybe they do. <laughs> um, so yeah, just showing you this. Um, this was on. Instagram yesterday. This is Holly Bleasdale, uh, Holly, Holly Bodshaw, sorry. Um, her, a pole vaulter, I'm sure you all know who she is. And she she did a couple of stories yesterday. Hopefully you can see the text easy enough here. Um, but I'll just read out a few points. Um, she's talking about her career and Holly was, you know, a great athlete from being quite young. Um, but she did get criticized about the way she looked because she didn't at the time looked like a typical pole vaulter. Um, and she, you know, one of the things I'm picking out here is that she Googled her own name and it just said Holly Bleasdale fat, which is awful, isn't it? I mean, she certainly was not that. Um, and certainly, you know, and she was like, like she says in the, in the text, you know, she was jumping brilliantly. She jumped to um, the third highest ever. Um, and yet somebody was thinking that it was appropriate to mention how they thought that she looked um and i thought you know i, I read, read this yesterday i added it to my presentation for tonight because i thought this is just you know this is just totally highlights i know holly's not an endurance athlete but she's a female athlete and this is the type of effect that it can have um just read this bit out i'm not one of these people who say i don't care what people think of me i do care it's created a lot of challenges for me throughout my life in terms of mental health and Holly works hard. That's why she often speaks out about these things. And even now she says it has an effect on, on um, what she wears when she competes um, because she doesn't want to show anybody her, her midriff. Because on the photograph um, that was commented on, it, Holly was wearing a crop top and shorts, you know, and 
that is just you know prime example of of how um body image can can have a knock-on effect and um, so i'm just going to go to now uh, the emotional needs of, of an athlete um so between your athlete and coach communication is key as we've said and this is not just about um talking about your menstrual cycle it's talking about everything um i i know john nuttall my my coach would have said i was sort of at, at times probably quite needy um not as needy as some athletes but i would you know if i asked him a question i wanted an answer um you know and i get annoyed with him about that and he wouldn't mind me saying that but he usually he you know usually we'd have a little bit of a chat about it and We'd, we'd sort things out. We had a, um, again, I was lucky that um, after Jeremy stopped coaching, that John, um, who I, it was a guy from my club, he'd run at Olympics and Commonwealth himself, and jo um, Jeremy had coached him as a youngster. So I had that sort of natural link. So it was a, it was a great, we had a great relationship, um, a very sort of, I'd sort of almost say like a, a friendship as much as a coach athlete relationship. And at that time for me, as an athlete, I I needed to have a little bit of control over what I was doing. I wanted to know why I was doing everything. Um, and John was, um, he, we, we had a, like, a bit of a collaboration, I suppose. He was the coach, but I would always say, what about this, what about the other? So for us, that that type of communication was key. And oft, um, when we started working together, John got a job away. Uh, he started being the endurance coach at Loughborough. So he was, um, you know an hour and a half two hours down the road from me so for us um i saw him maybe every, i probably saw him every week mostly um once a week but the rest of the time i was doing sessions on my own or with with a group in preston and having to let him know how things were going so for for, for me that was massive and that's something um that is important with any any athlete actually male or female but um i think females I think you just need to get to know what the athlete needs um, and what they what they feel happy like some athletes might want to speak on the phone all the time some hate speaking on the phone and just want to text or whatsapp so I think like having that conversation early in the athlete coach relationship about how how are we communicating and agreeing a method um helps a great deal and stops anyone thinking that they're being forgotten about especially if the coach coaches a lot of athletes um i've put there um consideration to bring in a neutral party so if if an athlete's struggling at all with with mental health or um anything else sort of that is stressing in their life i think as a coach you you know it might be that the athlete wants to talk to you but and it might be that they they have a partner or family member that they they um, talk to about any issues emotionally. But if they don't, or if they're not comfortable with that, I think it's good to sort of have somebody else. So whether that's a sports psychologist or a counsellor, doesn't have to be sport, um, that could help um, if the athlete is really struggling. I think for us coaches, you know, we have to recognise what's going on and act upon it um yeah so considering bringing in somebody else who can you know be be some a sounding board for the athlete is is well worth thinking about and um, we're lucky at Leeds Hub that we have sports psychologists on on our team so you know we have a you know the athletes have a really good setup there um but that's not always been the case you know coaching at club at club athletes um that I've had that opportunity. So having someone on, if you know your athlete has that person that they can talk to, then that's really, really good. Um, life balance and life management. So I think this is really, really important for athletes, male or female, obviously, but just having, you know, having a balance between what you're doing in your training and what you're doing in your life. So whether that's education, work, um, social life, um, family, you know, it's got to be balanced really well. And I think like for myself as an athlete, I was really, really lucky. I had massive support in family um, that, you know, just support, backed me up whatever I needed to do. And my husband there, who's pictured with me at uh, the Sydney Olympics, um, you know, was always, he was actually that person that I could 
that would maybe sort me out emotionally if I was having a wobble. Um, and also, you know, just massive supporter of my athletics. So for me, having that that family and and, and Neil to support me was, I'm sure, made you know, made me the athlete that I was. Um, in terms of life management, I think that's something that I found. Um, as I, my main experience is coaching athletes who are sort of over 18. Um, and, you know, often it, these athletes are at a time in their life where it's the work works takes quite high precedent in their sort of time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about an athlete shortly um, in relation to that. But yeah, just like having time for everything and realizing like what impact that can have on on the training plan. Um, finding out what the stresses are for the athlete. So is it work? Are they working a lot of hours? Um, are they under pressure with their education? Have they got any injuries that they're really worried about or not dealing well with or illnesses? And, and obviously performance is massive, you know, so having a plan. Um, I, most girls I have worked with like a plan they want to know what's happening they want to know when they want to know why as coaches we you know we, we have to plan ahead um but yeah um i'd say my experience with female athletes is they they prefer to know what's happening um using training peaks is great for that because the athlete if they if they're the type of athlete that needs to know i do it a week in advance i don't i don't do more than that because i, I don't like um i like to tweak things as we go along um, but they can have a little week in advance and they know what the session is um, before they get to the track if they want to. There are some athletes who like to toe the line and say, what, what are we doing today? So, you know, just getting, that's another sort of uh, example of getting to know what that individual needs. Um, and yeah, all these things, um, you know, that can make a happy athlete and a happy athlete is most likely to perform well. If you're happy with everything else that's going on in your life, um, then your athletics is probably going to go well. If something's tipping, off, you know, tipping the balance, then it's probably going to affect the athlete's performance. So, you know, having that chat after training um, about something other than training is is sometimes well worth it. Um, getting to know, getting to know the person, not just the athlete. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk. Uh, LZ Wyman Davis is an athlete that I coach. She's quite happy for me to talk about her. I thought she was a really good example of this sort of what we need to think about um, and how we've had to adapt um, with what Elsie does for a job. She's a, a doctor. Um, when I first started um, coaching her, she was full time doctor. So you're probably talking 60 hours a week. And she was also um, training for a marathon. Um, she'd had a history of um stress fractures before I started coaching her um so we were sort of aware of that but I probably didn't quite appreciate how much the stresses of work were impacting on the training plan because she would always you know she as an athlete and she'll say this herself she would always say she's fine she's not tired she wouldn't want to miss a session that was written down which I know I would have been uh, exactly like that as an athlete if it was written down I'd want to do it um, but um, we, she did get another stress fracture and um, we did then, I, I just said, look, we need to sort of plan, plan your life better. So we need, I need to know, you know, if you're standing on um, doing wards on the round, um, rounds on the wards even, you know, for 11 hours stood on your feet, that that is going to, that's impacting on how, how tired you are and how that, you know, how you're going to be running. Um, and also, um, from a red S point of view, although Elsie was eating what she thought was sufficient food, when we actually looked into it with the help of uh, nutritionist Rini McGregor, um, she was fant a fantastic person to work with, um, we realised that actually, you know, we needed to look at the time she was spending on her feet the stress of being a doctor and the um volume of training in the week in order for her to get, make sure she wasn't sort of falling into that red s category and not fueling her body enough for what she was actually asking it to do so it's quite easy as a coach to just think about the training plan but actually you know if we don't sort of um, look at what's going on and what the athlete is doing in school. They might be doing sport, you know, five times a week, then coming training and not 
you know not fueling enough for that so that's something you know it's a massive thing to think about and a good well worth it's something that you know as coaches we, we're learning we learn every day don't we uh, uh, you know the puzzle of coaching any athlete it's like getting the puzzle right um yeah so all these things so happy home life which she's really she's got and um, fitting in physiotherapy and massage which you know if you uh, she's now um working part-time as a, a doctor part-time but as a doctor still about 30 hours a week but we're man it, it's made um training a lot more manageable for Elsie um so fitting in things like that planning for races um also planning for races around a menstrual cycle so one thing that um Elsie was um taking contraception well she was on the had the coil fitted which meant that she wasn't having a period um so when when she had a stress fracture we, i was like you know i really think we need to know if you're having a period and Rini mcgregor agreed that this would be very useful um you know having that regular cycle is a massive indicator of if you know if things are good in in the in the body so um elsie actually did have that removed and regained uh, got her normal cycle which was was thankfully normal but it gave us that information and now we use that as a you know an indicator if anything's um maybe off and we need to sort of up up the um calorie intake a little bit um and also um using the period tracker app we we sort of can think about racing so for example there's a few races starting to come onto the calendar now um elsie's entered two that are quite close together and we're going to choose the one because uh, we know her period is due around that time so we're probably going to choose the one that's most appropriate because she does feel a little bit fatigued around around a period um and then strength and conditioning this is something that elsie has really taken on board she is such a strong athlete and i feel like this is you know this is another thing that's going to really help her sort of stay injury free and strong so yeah just a quick example of all these things that we've got to think about for any athlete but with the female athlete thinking about the menstrual cycle and that around race planning which doesn't always work like i said that you know you know you might it might happen when it's the olympic games <laughs> um if you're having a natural cycle um and that's something that you can decide to do or some athletes will use a contraception contraceptive pill to sort of um manipulate their periods a little bit um that's not something i've ever done but i'm not against it and um, it's something that i would advise you to sort of look into if it's something that um you think might be a good thing for your athlete but what i would say is that i'd like i like athletes to have had a few years of having a regular menstrual cycle before they, they think about having a taking something that is just to manipulate their cycle i think it's really important that's just my opinion um yeah so i've just listed that i'll leave this on the screen for a little bit and um, some of the uh websites or podcasts or names that you can perhaps follow um around these subjects nikki dr nikki k um is a doctor of endocrinology endocrinology so she's it's hormone doctor she did a really good webinar for england athletics that you could look at if you um, go into the athletic athletics hub you can watch it back um it was based around masters athletes actually so that's the other, another thing i've not actually mentioned is so if you're a coach for masters female athletes so, uh, thinking about hormones in relation to the menopause or perimenopause and um, strongly suggest you um look up that webinar it's really really interesting um nikki is uh offers quite a lot of advice on her website and also on the website healthforperformance.co.uk um gives you some really good signposts if you're having problems with with your cycle um or any red s issues um Rini mcgregor um is a nutritionist uh, who i strongly recommend you uh, either listen to or read up on or look at some of her books she's, she's absolutely fantastic i've worked with her with a couple of my athletes female and male um around sort of fueling for um marathons so getting the fueling right around marathons she's been absolutely brilliant um, but her expertise is in eating disorders um, and athletes so um, and red s so she's that's somebody who i would definitely recommend the train brave is is um dot org is uh, Rini's 
website as well and then the female athlete podcast which is um jess piasecki is one of the hosts who i just mentioned earlier um georgia brimville's um they talk about various topics that affect female athletes not just runners but um there's some absolutely fascinating um, podcasts there's one that i listened to recently that i really recommend and it was with liz mccolgan and ailish mccolgan talking around um um periods and her cycle and i thought that was it was a really really good in, um podcast so for any any coaches who sort of want to hear you know what an athlete at ailish's level has sort of had to think about in terms of getting the best out of herself it's it's well worth a listen and then I've, i listened to one this week from off track podcast and this is two actually two of the girls who actually train at leeds um they're both athletes in their 20s Bronwyn owen and leah and their their topic this week was actually on body image so i thought i'd give them a mention as well that was really really good but i think it's quite good because they're athletes who are sort of living and breathing sport and giving giving you sort of an athlete version of things and then two two and um, this list is not extensive i'm sure there's so many more people i could have added onto this but um two people i follow on um social media on twitter is trent stellingworth who's a canadian um physiologist um he's done some really good research on females and red s and gareth stanford as well um they're both well worth a follow um lots of they'll they often like retweet interesting articles on, on these subjects as well so i'm coming towards the end um i need to check the time actually okay not too i'll try and be quick i realize i've talked for quite a long time um so i asked quite a few coaches what do you do differently when coaching females to males so i'm just going to run through a few of the answers that i got because i thought it'd be quite good to um i can't actually see the whole screen here so might not be able to read it else. I'll just I'll just flick through them and let you read them. But I think it just gives you um, a bit of an idea of what other coaches are thinking or considering. I'll leave that on for a little bit. Quite a lot of things that I'm sure um, everybody will feel they do do some of or have sort of similarities in their coaching. A lot of coaches mentioned that they don't really think of the athlete as a female, they just think of the athlete as an individual and then um, deal with anything that that individual requires, which I agree with. So good to know that planning and expectation is, is in this coach's um, consciousness. This one I quite liked. Just uh, this is a little bit more about sort of personality, so it is a little bit general. But um, you know, the coach was sort of saying that the guys he coaches generally just do what they what they're told, whereas the females they want to know why, which is probably a little bit what I was like as an athlete, um, and definitely a lot of the girls who I coach now. You know, what pace, what intensity, what we're looking for. They need more information, but quite often they get better results from the session because they have that personality. But there are guys like that as well, so um a lot of coaches yeah said the same thing finding that women are better planners and organizers so yeah training the athlete according to their their individual needs quite a good one i'll get through these quick unconscious i mean there might be some questions so i'm gonna rush through these um this one's quite interesting, sort of, you know, the coach sort of sees the girls and just get on with it, but actually they need reining in a little bit more because they perhaps won't hold the hand up like, like I said earlier, you know, and say, saying I'm tired or they don't want to change the session because they're tired, you know, so the coach has to be a little bit more aware of that with, with the females that he coaches. And this one was really good. Um, not a taboo area and uh, talk around the guys like we should be doing just like it's just it's just something that happens that you know most women most women have a period so it's something we need to talk about around training right i'm going to play you this video just to finish um it's, hopefully it will work with sound um this is an actress um who sent me this her sister is a runner and she made this video um 
because of what she's seen her sister go through. So it's based on a, a young athlete. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Do you remember when you were little and you were learning to ride your bike around Wentworth Park? Granny was sitting on the bench watching you and it wasn't long until every dog walker, every runner, every other passerby was watching you. Even the other little children stopped to stare at you. Because someone told you that if you tell yourself you can do it, you'll be able to. And that's exactly what you did. It was remarkable. You pedalled around the path, repeating that message to yourself over and over again. I can do it. You wobbled from side to side, almost falling flat on your face. But you didn't fall. You wobbled, but you didn't fall completely because you told yourself you could do it. You learned to ride faster than I did. And everybody in your way stood aside to let you pass because they could see you coming. I've always seen you coming. I've seen you run rings around the boys, knackering yourself out because you were desperate to prove that biology wouldn't make you slower or weaker or not as good. Nothing will ever hold you back. I used to hate being a woman. I used to see all of the advantages that men had, and I used to hate the fact that I was born a woman. I had no choice about it. From birth, I was lumbered with a fight against patriarchy. It's much better than it was in the past, but it still exists. I still go for a run and have to put up with the fact that I'm going to be whistled at because I'm wearing shorts. But now I realise that it makes the success even greater when you start with a disadvantage. The start line is uneven. Some people get a head start and some of us have to catch up before the trigger is even pulled. There's a million people that will want to stand in your way. And only a few that will stand aside and push you forward. Each hurdle makes the finish line just a little bit closer. And each time you leap over it, there's another story to tell. Another bit of fuel on the fire. Nobody will be able to catch you. You all make them wish that they could run like a girl. I'm hoping that played okay and you could hear it. Um, but I, I thought that was really quite emotive and very current, actually, with the you know, things that have been happening recently in terms of women and runners in general, uh, women runners and how things have been going for them. So thanks, Chair, for um, sending me that. And uh, hopefully we might have some questions, Liz. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks very much, uh, <laughs> Jane, Helen. That was, that was great. Um, I think yeah, there's only one question from, <laughs> from me to begin with, if that's OK, around um, how what advice you give to coaches around, well, when an athlete's going through a plateau, really, we see it quite commonly with younger girls when they're approaching those teenage years, especially. But it can happen, obviously, through any out your career. But what advice do you, would you give to coaches to manage that situation? Yeah, I think maybe sort of talking to the athlete that this might happen. It's not a negative, um, but, it, you know, if, if it's just in general conversations, sort of often, you know, this might happen, but we just have to think about the big picture and the, the, the journey that we're taking. I think sort of having that sort of conversation um, can really help. I know myself, I had, you know, a, quite a few years right around the same time every year, um, you know, and I, I, I did my athletics because I, I loved running and racing. But yeah, I could I think I can understand why some females would um, be put off by that. So I think as a coach, it's like important to just let them know that this is quite normal um, and it's well worth riding it out. Great. Yeah, great advice there, Ellen. Um, also around S&C programs and things, you touched on it already, but do you vary the program much between male and female athletes? I mean, you've talked about certain areas you centre on um, with, with female athletes specifically. Um, well, at 
at Leeds, we have an SNC coach, so they do the programming for SNC for the athletes. Um, I guess we, with athletes I've worked with prior to sort of having that opportunity to work with an SNC coach, I've always sort of worked quite closely with the physio. Um, so looking at the, the individuals you know, potential sort of, sort of injury, um, you know, make, maybe doing like some sort of fun, functional screening with the athlete and, you know, individualizing that a little bit. So the s &C program might have some generic um, stuff in, but they'll also have some personal stuff in that is specific to the athlete's requirements from what we've picked up from physio sessions and maybe previous injuries and anything, you know, looking at the athlete running, you know, the biomechanics, that sort of thing. So I think, again, it's sort of, being quite individual about it um, is important. Hope that answers the, the question. Yeah, that's great. Um, guys, any more questions for, for Helen before we, we wrap up? I'll give you a, a yeah, what we got. Just Tony just saying excellent session. So that's a thumbs up, Helen. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, just just waiting for any more questions to come in. But no, I think um, I think you're right. I think that one of the reasons we want to do this is to look at those subtleties between female male coaching. But I think you're, you're right about looking at that individual coaching that person in front of you seems to be the key message coming out of this, really. Um, but obviously taking into consideration there are those those differences, um, you know, as well. Um, OK, so doesn't appear to be any more questions coming in guys um so on behalf of welsh athletics uh, helen really appreciate uh, you giving up your time this evening um and for a really good presentation um yeah and um for the rest of you um that completes the webinar the performance webinar series um so again we have our youth development conference coming up on the weekend as well so again those of you who already have signed up and you work with youth development athletes that's a great opportunity as well but yeah no thank you a lot uh, thank you very much again helen and uh, yeah hope to see you soon and um take care everybody thanks for having me